Casper, a very warm welcome to the show. Good to see you on the screen you. anyway. Um, how are you? Very good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. Now, from your profile, it seems that like you've done many things. Actor, producer, poker player, commentator, speaker. Have I missed anything out? No, most of those were a long time ago. It should be said, speaker for the last 20 years or so. But um, oh, TV commercials director. Um yeah, and 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 sort of uh, filmed uh, short film television director that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, uh, and just from a, a UK, we got a lot of UK listeners, and some of them might be of an age where they remember a, a program called Biker Grove. Apparently, you were in that. Is that true? They're really old. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I go back thirty-four years now to the first two series uh, with Deck, but before Ant. Oh I'm yeah, and that original. Yeah, he didn't come until series two. Now, before they became a partnership, truly, it was. It was. That's right. I, that was some hard hitting stuff as well, as I remember from Biker Grove. They tackle some uh, strong storylines. About right, the blindness, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, in our in our uh, eighty nine ninety, it was really hard hitting, and then they they went down a couple of years. So a lot of Biker Grove is quite sort of kiddie, but it, when it started, its intention was to be a sort of challenge for Grand Chill, but the BBC wanted it to be a little younger than Grand Chill eventually. Okay. Okay. So for anyone that doesn't uh, remember it or haven't seen it, but. Uh, by all means, Google it. You could probably find it on the uh, interweb somewhere. It's on the YouTubes. Ah, it's on the YouTubes. Excellent. Check it out. It was very good. OK, but we're not here to talk about that. Unfortunately, uh, we are here to talk, well, mainly based around your poker playing days, but certainly uh, relationship with some of the stuff that you went through in poker playing days to what it might be to investors. So investors got this long year to look ahead um, and there's plenty of risks out there, as we saw from last year as well. Um, I just want to start with the first question. Um, how do you know when to take risks, given whatever backdrop you're in? So on, on a poker playing days, you know, you're sitting at your poker uh, table. How do you know when to take a risk and when to well, when to stick or when to twist? Oh, OK, well, I'm going to answer that two, two ways, actually, because I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a more interesting answer in a way to like, why should we take risks generally? Right. And the answer to that question is when you want increased returns. Right. Um, like because I'm a speaker talking about taking risk, I think some people sometimes interpret what I'm saying as you should always take risk, right? And and that's not true at all, of course. Um, so like, for example, I've had um, a number of people say to me over the years, you know, you're telling us to take risk, but you've been a speaker now for 20 years. Now, there's two things to say. Yes, but that's because I did take risk every two years, did those things, other things that you said, screenwriter, director, actor, etc., entrepreneur. Um, until I found this thing that I love, right? And I'm very happy uh, in this situation and um, love love my job. And so why would I want to disrupt that? Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't want increased returns by all the intangibles that we we judge our job. Now, I'm always, you know, I'm always trying new things. I take a risk every time I go onto a stage, believe me, you know, because I can die. Um, <laughs> but... But that's the reason why we take risk. And if you're not happy, if you if you if you are completely happy, then you don't need to take risk unless you go. Well, uh, that life would be boring. You go, yeah, cool, life would be boring. So we always need to mix it up a little bit. So we always need to take some risk. Where I think companies are interesting, right? There's that great documentary, isn't it, the corporation that says that a company in law is a psychopath, right? Because because it has a you know duty to shareholder to keep maximizing returns. So technically, a company should never be happy right a company should never be content so a company actually should always be taking risk which is why i think you know they're like athletes as speakers because they're also always driving for more you know as an athlete you never even if you just won the gold you know you've got to get better than the next olympics because everyone else is so that's the first thing why people take risk and the second thing about poker you talk about sticking and twisting obviously that's that's blackjack is the first thing to say <laughs> but i mean um in poker you should be playing if you think that that game has an opportunity uh, to take risk, that is what we call expectation positive, right? And that's where we come back to the calculation that I showed in the presentation I show, which many people watching this will be second nature to, but some it won't be. It's the calculation at the origin of the phrase, the calculated risk. And, and, and basically in poker, you should carry on playing or you should take a risk with this hand um, if you believe that, that the opportunity as calculated for risk with upsides, downsides and probabilities is expectation positive. And, and that's when we should be taking risk. In life, that's not always the case because it might be that the upside or the increased expectation is not worth the potential 
downside. In other words, you don't want that enough, basically. And how practically, how are you calculating those probabilities and those odds when you're taking those risks? In, in poker? Mm. I guess one answer to that is as well as possible, right? Because, because so in the presentation, um, I showed a very simple uh, situation where we had an upside of 4,000. That's in the middle of the table. That's what we can win, a downside of 400. Um, and I constructed a situation where we had a 25% chance of success. Now, technically, by the way, in that poker situation, I didn't say this in the presentation, but that's a very rare situation because someone's giving you a, a return on your investment there of 175%, which is obviously huge. Um, and therefore, the person that's betting the 400 is making a mistake Okay, in that situation. But we're getting that calculation um by by multiplying our upside by 25 percent so 25 percent is 4,000 is 1,000 our downside by 75 percent so 75 percent of 400 is minus 300 that creates an overall expectation of our long-term upside plus our long-term downside which is a thousand minus 300 which equals 700 right so that that's the basis of that calculation now poker players didn't make up that calculation again and i'm talking to a very experienced audience of risk takers here um it's taken from the risk reward uh, an analysis that was basically born of Fermat and Pascal's language of probability, first actually given to us by Girolamo Cardano, a Renaissance Italian mathematician. Um, and all we did in poker is just nick a little bit of it. And that calculation forms the basis of insurance. It's like, that's that's the true value of the policy, so I'm going to sell you it for that. It forms the basis of credit, uh, forms the basis of the valuation of anything under uncertainty. And when I say do it as well as possible, what I mean is that there are some situations in poker, like the the hypothetical but perfectly real situation that I've relayed there, where it's 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 calculable, and even sometimes where the probability is what you might call semi-objective, right? But the second thing is, but 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 most of the time in poker, we might have a decision tree that goes out to sixty-four different points, right? Not just two upside and downside, but sixty-four different ones. Like, what if we call and they raise? What if we call and they call? What if we raise and they fold? What if we raise and they re-raise? Do you know what I mean? So there's all sorts of different possibilities. And although there are some players at the highest levels of the game doing that calculation live, right, and, and making decisions accordingly, it's too far beyond uh, most of us mortals, right, to do it. And then the second problem is, as Bruno Di Finetti, another Italian mathematician, says in his two-volume Meisterwork on the subject of probability, there is no such thing as probability, right? Even the toss of a coin is a synthetic probability because what if it's a, you know, it's brilliantly um, uh, relayed in, in um, Nass uh, Nassim Taleb's Black Swan, right? If a coin comes down heads 40 times in a row, is that a statistical outlier or is it a two-headed coin, right? So even logical probabilities in the real world are still subjective, right? And so all probabilities are subject to our assessments based on our experiences and based on what we know and everyone knows different things about a situation. So you do that calculation as best you can, but don't be deluded into thinking that the number you have on the bottom line is, is real or objective because it's not. We were talking about there's lots of risk coming out for the uh, coming uh, year ahead, uh, and you know investors, probably poker players as well. When the going's good, they're notoriously greedy. When the going's bad, they're notoriously fearful. How do you know when enough is enough? Uh, when things are going well, how do you know enough's enough and to you know take your profits, or when you're when things are going badly to cut your losses? So you might have um, a cultural reason for that, like you might have had a, a, a target given to you by, you know, a, a boss or your team or what have you, um, in which case you stop for that reason. But interesting, we had this this question during the during the session itself, and it's important not to come. It's not important not to confuse two things, right? Because sometimes people talk about stop loss limits with respect to gambling, right? By which I mean roulette, blackjack, the gambling games in a casino where you pretty much always have a negative expectation. And uh, it's part of a longer point, but, but the longer point is that it's all bunkum, right? That, that, that it doesn't matter when you stop playing roulette. It doesn't matter when you, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're $200 down or $400 up or whatever. If you carry on playing roulette, it's still all one session. The, the, the wheel is going to take 2.7% or 5.4% of every dollar you put down, right? So there's no, so again, it comes back to culturally, when do you feel like this roulette session is now no longer enjoyable, like you've lost too much money and you should go to bed, okay? So so that's when you should stop playing roulette. 
When you should stop playing poker, again, could be cultural. As I said in the session, like you might have just had enough, right? You might want to go and have dinner with someone. Um, there might also be lots of different things that make it now a negative expectation for you personally because you're making bad decisions. What might cause that? You've lost too much money. You're hurting. You're emotionally affected. Uh, you're tired. Um, you don't want to play with these particular people because one of them sends you on tilt. You don't like them. All sorts of things like that. But technically, if all of that is put to one side in poker, you should carry on playing as long as you have a positive expectation. And you might be 50 big blinds down, right? You might be a lot of money down. If you know that these four players are bad players and they're donating to the game, you should absolutely carry on sitting there and playing as long as, again, you're not you're not tired or emotionally affected or, you know, what have you. And that's something that, that so if I can try and sum that up, it's important not to take ideas which are already wrong for gambling right stop lock well, knowing when to stop right if you if you want to make money in gambling don't gamble right because you're not going to you might aberrationally in the short term but in the long term it doesn't matter when you start and stop you have a negative expectation every time you play roulette so don't take those bad ideas and apply them to positive expectation situations because it's the expectation that dictates whether you should carry on playing not how long you've been doing it or how much you're up or down at the time so if you re relate, relate that to investment, you know, if you truly believe if you've done your homework and you truly believe that company is a good company, do you think you should keep investing in, in them? You see, again, I'm going to come back to the cultural problems. Right. So so um, uh, one of the things that Kahneman and Tversky won their Nobel Prize for um, in the early 2000s, I think, uh, was the S-shaped utility curve. And the S-shaped utility, utility curve is really interesting for a lot of trading rooms. Right. It explains human nature in a lot of situations. And in fact, in some ways, it's actually interestingly different to what you said earlier on, which is when people get greedy and fearful. Because in a lot of trading rooms, people will bank a profit, right? Because they want to see lots of green numbers. and But they'll hold on to losses, red numbers, because all they want is for them to become green, right? The s utility curve explains that because once we've got our green profit, more green profit, which might emanate from a positive expectation, is not going to make us feel that much better because it's a green number. And more red loss that might emanate from holding on to a negative expectation doesn't really affect us because it's it's still a red number, right? And so we actually become greedy and fearful in the opposite direction there um, because we just want to we just want to bank wins. That's like that's like leaving a poker room when you're up. OK, because you want to be able to put a green tick on that day of the calendar. But it's but it's mental because you're not you're not maximizing expectation. So theoretically, it's as pure as that. But I'm not trying to override whatever very sensible cultural. Um, uh, what's the word? Sort of buffers that a trading room or an organization or a team or a boss may bring into that for two reasons. A, because. The, the culture is king, right? And certainly what your boss is, is king. And secondly, because some of those cultures are built up to try and prevent other mistakes, um, you know, the taking of um, risk when the expectation is low because someone feels bulletproof because they've had a lot of wins in the past, right? And, and, and their part of the theory is to stop, you know, when you're ahead and good. There's a brilliant book called The Hour Between Dog and Wolf by Dr. John Coates, which talks about um, testosterone in this process, that testosterone is both a reward for and um, an instigator of risk-taking and can precipitate uh, what may start off as virtuous but become vicious circles uh because because uh, gains turn into inappropriate risk and cultures have instigated buffers to prevent that and i'm not trying to override those at all but the theory is pretty clear that that when the expectation is positive we should be taking that risk but but in practice there are all sorts of reasons why we shouldn't do that and they're fine so with everything that's going on i mean how do investors in particular overcome you've mentioned quite a lot of psychological biases there how do they overcome those biases you know to, to potentially hopefully make the right decision yeah i mean again a poker player does have a certain luxury here which is and by the way not all poker players i was going to say we're lone wolves right because a, a lot of poker players these days particularly the highest limits are backed they have backers and and what you want is a backer that 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 thinks long-term too. Again, what I said during the session was that we want to try and map our emotions onto our results. So we do want some pleasure from the upside, all right? Because that will motivate us to take good risks and upsides of the reward for that. And we do want some pain for downside, 
words, right? Otherwise, we go around touching hot saucepans all the time. So some emotional uh, uh, response um, is 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 a good thing, but we want it to be pro- proportionate. So greed is a disproportionate upside, and fear is a disproportionate downside. So so that's the first thing. But the second thing, the thing that a poker player can do that, again, we can't always culturally do is just think as long term as possible. I mean, ideally, you, you want to be thinking of the infinite time period. Right. Um, my my simple um, uh, analogy for that is let's say you're a salesman. OK. And you've got two piles of leads and one pile of leads, the actual value of each sale. So the expectation is very low, but, but you know, you've got a very high expectation of someone saying yes. And then you've got another pile of leads where the potential uh, sale value is huge, um, but uh, it's it's very, very hit and miss. Now, if you've got a sales director who's not going to check over you for a quarter, then you're going to go to the, the high value leads, right? Because you've got a time period there over which to hit some sort of expectation, the law of large numbers to kick in. If you've got a sales director who's who or a boss or who's looking over you at the end of every day, then you're going to go for the low value leads, right? It's, it's as simple as that. And I mean, I, I honestly think that the greatest company that I know on the planet, a big company corporation, not startup, where they inculcate that mindset quite a lot, but the one that's maintained it through trillion dollar worth is is Google, right? They just understand from day one that if you cut open Google like a stick of rock, inside that company, you've got hundreds of thousands of decision makers and decisions being made every day. And they, we want them all to be incentivized to maximize ROI, not results at the end of every eight hours, basically. And and that's how we should be motivating and judging people who make any investments, either coalface money investments or the more intangible investments of business on a daily basis. Well, you mentioned Google there, and there's uh, an entity we do need to throw into the mix here, and that's AI. How do you think that might be changing the game? Because in the past, and again, poker players, and from an investment point of view, you always thought you were, you know, you were betting, not betting, you were trading against humans. I mean, uh, electronic trading systems have been in use in the investment industry for a very, very long time now, but now throw in AI. How do you think that might change things? It's going to be massive, isn't it? In lots of ways that some 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 are quite easy to see and about which we might be wrong and some of which are quite hard to see. Um, again, during the session, we had brilliant questions during the session. Um, someone mentioned AI and I, and I said uh, in a slightly long-winded way that it's going to kill online poker ultimately in a way that bots never did, right? Because a couple of things about bots. Number one, they have to be programmed. So the algorithms have to be good, okay? Um, and number two... Um, uh, number two, like it was okay if you had four bots at a table because in some ways they actually provide a level of ballast. Like if you've got four or five pros at a table, that's not a bad thing because you're all you're all basically uh, picking on what you want is three or four tourists, right, who are donating, okay? So bots never really cause that much of a problem. AI uh, in poker is going to kill the game, I think, above a certain level, below which it's just not worth it's just not worth people's bother, right? There's better ways of, of, of directing AI than low limit poker or even mid limit poker. But above a certain limit, it's gonna kill it because um, after three trillion hands, these blank slate, just machine learned neural network based um, uh, decision makers are gonna make uh, the best possible decisions. They, get, they are already better than human decision makers. Now, if we apply that to the markets, I mean, look, this is this is my belief of markets, right? which is all markets tend to want efficiency, but the two caveats to that are um, the period of time in which it takes to get there usually leaves a lag, which might it might be a couple of minutes or it might be several years of, of um, inefficiency to exploit, okay? And the second thing is, while poker is a zero sum game, in fact, it's a slight negative sum game because the poker site or the, or the uh, casino is taking a small vig of every hand or the tournament take or whatever. Markets in general, I think, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Benoit Mandelbrot calculates it at about a six point six seven percent average return. If you're if you're on mass, you know all all the trades made by um, a big company for ten years. Okay, so so it might tend toward efficiency, but if the efficient return is six point six seven percent, then that's then that's pretty good anyway, right? But but AI surely is going to expedite the time frame 
that that efficiency is reached right from from minutes to microseconds uh, or from or from years to days um because it's just a way of uh, disseminating perfect perfect information i mean the, the promise of ai in the long term is that we all her i think is a brilliant it's a film called her with yak and phoenix is a brilliant um model for where I, 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 ai will go and you have an earpiece and you have a a screen right and this thing is the best doctor on the planet and we all have as much access to it as we want to because it's treating billions of patients at the same time and it's seen you know it's read every single medical journal um and so you can't if you're bill gates you can't get a better doctor than this no, it's not it's not right there yet and now but that's the promise of this it's the best lawyer on the planet um it's the best joke teller on the planet and therefore in theory it will be the best trader on the planet right why why wouldn't it be if 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 that's the access to the perfect information that we all will have I get that there will be a certain time reward for the kind of split microseconds that the black boxes can uh, make. But beyond that, that kind of democratization of knowledge, which started with Google, as you said, um, and but will reach its apotheosis with AI. I don't see where our edge in any market is going to be as a result of that. And it's not just poker and it's not just uh, trading, you know, take my my work. My work is teaching people. And what happened with Google was it was amazing. We all got access to this perfect information. So if you wanted to create a course on risk taking or learning French, you you had access to the information that, that could create that course. But with AI, it will create the course, right? So where's the where's the edge that the course creator has in that? Where's the edge that any creator of information has when it's not just access to perfect information, but perfect uh, analysis and synthesis of that information. I, I don't see where that goes, and I'll be interested to experience it. Yeah, I suspect we'll find out sooner rather than later on that, yeah. given the speed yeah. with which everything's moving. So just to sum all that up, if you were to give our listeners three tips for the coming year ahead, they're going into their trading in terms of you know their biases, how they might want to view things, what, what, what are the best three tips you might be able to offer them? Yeah, great. So, I mean, always think about future expectation. You know, don't succumb to um, uh, sunk costs, bias. Uh, it's not about how much we've put in. It's about what the expectation is. Um, try and think as long term as possible. Again, you'll have cultural constraints to doing that, but um, probably too late in the day now for me to tell a little story. But the little story that I tell, that I think illustrates it's a true story about a CEO of, of a company we all know. And the point is that even when you get to be CEO, people still tell you what you should do you know and 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 how you should think and all the rest of it and if you want to have the space to make decisions in your way you have to fight for that you're never going to get to a point where oh i can just do what i want now um so so try and fight for the space to think as long term as possible and then the third thing is something we haven't really mentioned yet but again i talk about in presentations which is which is tetlock's um study about political judgment and the slightly counterintuitive finding that the, the people who are most humble at the point of making their predictions about the future tend to be the most successful. So the people who re who regard it as very difficult, uh, respect the size of the task, try and get as much data and information as possible um, in order to in order to make their decisions rather than going, yeah, I've been trading for 20 years now, I've got this lit because the black swans will always surprise us. And, and I've got a final little tip, I think, about black swans, actually, which is that, that, that they don't come from extrapolation population of, of data and lines um because everyone watching this will have more data than most people out there you know in this slightly just pre-ai age um and so i actually believe there's an edge to be had from using our uh intuition um and and, and trusting our feelings and sensations um beyond the data and i think that actually that explains some of tetlock's findings that people who were successful couldn't necessarily put their feelings into words i think that sometimes it's good to uh you know look at the state of geopolitics at any given time and just feel how the future might be and if that involves a big upturn um then you know have some faith in that feeling because there's reasons that we have those feelings ultimately Asper, some very sage advice hopefully our uh, listeners can go and take that away and hopefully look forward to a, a positive new year thanks so much for joining us it's been a pleasure to speak to you Okay, thank you. That's very, thanks so much.